This program is brought to you by Emory University. Hello, everyone. My name is Patrick Marr. I'm the uh, Executive Symposium Editor for the EBDJ. Uh, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing today's corporate panel. Uh, first, I have a couple of administrative things. Number one, uh, parking vouchers. Uh, on your way out at the tables that you checked in at, we have parking vouchers. So uh, if you drove here today and parked, we have a voucher for you. We also have a EBDJ commemorative tote bag for our guests. Uh, please, yeah, look to the right when you go out the doors. We have some tote bags. Uh, I've been told to say they are not for the EBDJ members. <laughs> Staff members, we get those uh, at a later date. These are for our esteemed guests today. Um, without further ado, I will, uh, I will present our, uh, our, first, our second topic. Uh, so the topic is JEVIC, the Supreme Court's ruling last year that raises as many questions as it answers, continues to be battled about in the lower courts, and deals with a lot of topics, structured dismissals, critical vendor theory, DIP roll-ups, absolute priority, and a lot of other matters that run the gamut of Chapter 11. Uh, to my right is Leah Fiorenza McNeil. Uh, she is an associate in Brian Cave's Bankruptcy Restructuring and Creditors Rights Group. She graduated from Mercer University School of Law in 2009 and the University of Georgia in 2006. Her restructuring and bankruptcy experience includes representation of distressed companies, Chapter 7 trustees, Chapter 11 trustees, creditors committees, and secured and unsecured creditors. She also represents lenders, financial institutions, and businesses in complex finance disputes, including loan defaults, real estate transactions, and breach of contract claims. Leah is also a contributing editor to Norton's Bankruptcy Law and Practice, the leading treatise in her field, and she contributed a new chapter entitled Depositions. And to her <coughs> right is Katie Good. Katie Good is a partner at Whitefield, Taylor, and Preston's Wilmington, Delaware office. She is a, uh, an Emory Law alum and EBDJ alum. She also graduated from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill in 2003. Uh, she regularly represents debtors, secured lenders, committees, asset purchasers, liquidation trusts, and other parties in Chapter 11 cases, as well as foreign representatives and other parties in Chapter 13 ancillary proceedings. Uh, Katie regularly litigates in bankruptcy court as well as in appeals court before federal district courts and courts of appeals. She has also represented companies in successful out-of-court restructuring and prepackaged and prearranged bankruptcy cases. Uh, in addition, Katie has substantial experience uh, with substantive non-consolidation options for structured finance transactions. Uh, to her right is Monique Hayes. Monique is a partner at Goldstein and McClintock in Miami, Florida. She focuses uh, her areas of practice on business transactions, commercial litigations, and corporate restructuring. She has extensive experience advising fiduciaries, corporate and nonprofit board members, entrepreneurs, and small businesses. Monique has successfully represented clients in a broad range of matters, including asset sales and acquisitions, finance transactions, bankruptcy plan confirmation, avoidance actions, directors and officer claim litigation, Ponzi scheme, and other fraud litigation. She has substantial experience representing franchisors and franchise bankruptcy proceedings. And in the innovation and technology sector, Monique has represented startups, entrepreneurs, and founders of uh, separate foundation and restructuring, due diligence, and related transactional matters. She received her JD from the University of Miami School of Law and her undergraduate degree from the University of South Florida. Uh, to her right is Alex Dukin. Alex is an associate at Bradley A. Rand Bolt Cummings in Nashville, Tennessee. She's also an Emory Law and EBDJ alum, so we welcome her back to campus today as well. Thank you. <laughs> she graduated in 2011 uh, and from Vanderbilt uh, with her BA in 2008. Alex re uh, regularly represents financial services and mortgage company clients with uh, compliance matters. Her practice focuses on the bankruptcy compliance and regulatory concerns that her clients face. Her practice also includes representations of debtors and creditors in Chapter 11 cases, out-of-court workouts, reorganizations, restructurings, and, litigate, and liquidations. Leah wrote the first substantive piece on JEVIC in the nation, which was then picked up and cited in the Loan Syndication and Trading Association, which is a leading trade group. She's also a regular monthly contributor to the Norton Bankruptcy Law Advisor. Uh, please join me in welcoming the corporate panel. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you all for being here. I'd also like to thank Emory and the Emory Bankruptcy 
Development Journal for allowing us to speak today on this issue. Uh, so we will be discussing Jevic, which is a Supreme Court case decision that uh, happened almost a year ago. And it affects, and its effects on Chapter 11 practice already, and its effects on Chapter 11 practice in the future. So I will first provide a very brief summary of Jevic, uh, a summary of Jevic that should help whether you've read Jevic 10 times or if you've never read it, which I will say, if you haven't read Jevic, I would highly recommend you do so. And then we will open up the panel and we will, we will discuss a number of topics um, today. And, and those topics will be, um, we'll, we'll discuss the issues that these practitioners, that my co-panelists, have experienced in their districts. And then also what we expect will change in Chapter 11 practice coming um, in the future. So uh, now for the brief summary of Jevic and um, just so for me to make Jevic incredibly simple, although it's not a simple and case and it's certainly not a, a simple opinion, but to make it simple for me, I focus on the parties and the parties' roles. So there are five parties, relevant parties of Jevic. There's the debtor, the debtor affiliates, and that's, that's what I'll call Jevic. And then there is the uh, Sun Capital, which is the equity holder and uh, junior lender of Jevic. And so this is important. So not only did Sun Cap was Sun Capital the equity holder due to a leverage buyout that occurred about two years before Jevic filed for bankruptcy, but um, it also had a junior lien and um, was fully secured in 1.7 million of the estate's assets. And so we'll talk about the estate's assets in a, in, a, in a minute, but it's important to know that they were equity holder and had it, were fully secured in this 1.7 million. The third party is CIT Group, and they were the secured lender. And the fourth party were the truck drivers. And so the truck drivers were Jevic's employees, and these employees were laid off when the company was wound down, so right around the time the company filed for Chapter 11. And they filed a Warren Act violation claim against the Jevic Estates, and also against Sun Capital, the equity holder. And they had it, the, uh, the truck driver employees got an $8.3 million judgment against the Jevic Estate. So those, these truck driver employees had a priority, priority um, wage claim in this, in, in this bankruptcy. And then also, uh, something that we'll also discuss later, the, the um, Truck driver employees also had a $3.1 million, or approximately $3.1 million general unsecured claim as well. And so the fifth and final party is the Unsecured Creditors Committee. And the Unsecured Creditors Committee in this case were, was given the right to file a fraudulent transfer claim action on behalf of the estate against Sun Capital, the equity holder, and CIT, which was the secured lender. And the reason for bringing the fraudulent transfer claim, um, action was because of the LBO, so the LBO that occurred in 2006. And so the theory is that uh, the LBO rendered the company insolvent. So back to the 1.3 million. So once the Jevix Chapter 11 was filed and the liquidation was ongoing, the estate essentially had two assets. It had the fraudulent transfer claim, which the committee was bringing, and then it also had the 1.7 million in cash. But remember, the cash is encumbered by the equity holders, so Sun Capital's lien. And um, at that point, it, there was no argument whether Jevic was administratively insolvent or not. It, it, we, you know, Jevic had uh, professional fees, it had administrative expense claims, it had the Jevic employee wage uh, priority claim, and then it also had uh, some tax, priority tax claims, and then the general unsecured creditors pool. So not enough money to go around by any means. So about three years after Jevic filed its chapter 11, four out of the five parties got creative. And so those four parties are Jevic the debtor, uh, the equity holder, Sun Capital, CIT, which is a secured creditor, and the committee. And they came to an agreement, a structured dismissal and settlement agreement that allowed for payment, and, and it, it's much more complicated than this, but, but for today, what essentially happened was CIT, the secured lender, agreed to put $2 million in. Uh, Sun Capital agreed to waive its liens on the 1.7 million of the state cash. 
and they agreed that the professionals, some of the administrative expenses, the tax, priority tax lien, or tax claims, and then the general unsecured creditors pool would get paid out. And so you know, it would filter down, skip over the truck driver employee wage claims, and go to the general unsecured um, pool. And I think there was like a, it was like a four cents on the dollar distribution. And so the interesting thing here is, well, so remember, the truck drivers not only had the employee wage claim, but they also had the general unsecured claim. But the structured dismissal settlement agreement required that not only the employee, the tr employee truck drivers get, not get paid on their 8.3 million priority wage claim, but they also were carved out of the unsecured creditors committee, or unsecured creditors distribution. And so they literally got, they were, they were carved out of this deal 100%. So um, obviously, it goes in front of the bankruptcy court. The bankruptcy court approves it over the objection of the truckers' employees and then also the uh, U.S. trustee. And um, was appealed, went to the district court and Third Circuit, and they both uh, uh, upheld the bankruptcy court's decision. And, um, and then in front of the Supreme Court, it was overruled. And the Supreme Court's ruling is, is narrow although it's had effects, as you will hear later today, um, a lot, lot more effects than we would have expected since it is so narrow. But the holding essentially says a bankruptcy court cannot approve a structured dismissal that provides for distributions that do not follow ordinary priority rules without consent when a structured dismissal, dismissal is an end of case distribution. And so the important things to remember here are priority skipping and end of case distribution. And so on that note, I'm actually gonna start our first question for today, and Alex, I'm gonna have you kick this off. And so, uh, is there any further guidance we can glean from the dissent in the Supreme Court's opinion? So I think there is, and before I jump into that, if y'all will just indulge me for a minute down memory lane, because it was in this auditorium several years ago when I started Emory, um, where we had a, kind of like a kickoff to um, the classes, and we sat in here, and I think we'd read some tort case, um, and, and the whole purpose of the session was to talk about the importance of holdings and whether they were narrow or broad, and in fact, even if they were narrow, how much you could extend them. So I remember this one specifically was like a tort case, and the question was, you know, what is the holding? Is it an eight-year-old boy who gets a head injury at a train track? You know, is, is that all this case stands for, or is it any person in the continental US who gets any injury, you know, how, how far or how narrow do they extend? And I think that's, um, there are many things about Devic that I think are very interesting and you could have a very long conversation about, but I, I think that's one that's very applicable here and I think that's a theme that will keep coming up in our discussions today, but to actually go back and answer your question, Leah, yes, there was a dissent in Jevic. Um, Justices Alito and Thomas did dissent, and um, the reason was they went back and they said, look, here's the thing is when the truckers, um, what we granted cert on was this specific question. Uh, whether the bankruptcy court may authorize distributions of settlement proceeds in a matter that violates statutory priority scheme. So that was the question that was before the Supreme Court. However, when the truckers filed their opening brief, they were presented with a much more narrow and specific question. And that one was uh, whether a Chapter 11 case may be terminated by a structured dismissal that distributes estate property in violation of the bankruptcy code's priority scheme. So I think the two major differences and narrowing here are the inclusion of structured dismissal um, as well as a specific focus on estate property. Um, so there are two main things that Justice and Alito, um, just, Justice Alito and Thomas talked about in their dissent, and uh, they called this a impermissible bait and switch, which I thought was an interesting choice of terms. But the first was they said, "Look, this is essentially this is not something we want to encourage future litigants um, to take this kind of path where you present one question, but then at the end of the day you try and push." another question through. Um, and then the second piece was that uh, they said, you know, this really is a novel area of law. There's a lot of um, 
case law percolating in the lower courts and appellate courts on structured dismissals. And since this is a relatively new concept with a lot of um, activity going on, it, it's probably one that may have warranted further activity before we took it up. So, and maybe it would help actually if we could just talk briefly about the benefits of structured dismissal before jumping into all the topics. Katie, I was hoping that maybe you could kick this one off. Absolutely. So, you know, what is a structured dismissal and why would someone, um, why would someone take this avenue rather than the other avenues out of Chapter 11? And those other avenues out of Chapter 11 be confirming your Chapter 11 plan, uh, converting your case to Chapter 7, uh, or um, going with a straightforward, plain vanilla dismissal of the case. Um, so the structured dismissal is a, um, a construct that, that came about, uh, I think, starting in the you know, mid-2000s, mid to late 2000s. Um, and it was presented as a cheaper and more efficient alternative than either a Chapter 11 liquidating plan or a Chapter 7 conversion. Um, and it, it usually provides for, um, for distribution of estate assets. The idea is that if you converted the case to Chapter 7, a Chapter 7 trustee would have to come in. They'd have to get up to speed. That would take additional time. They would have to do their own in, in, uh, investigation. That would take more time and cost more money, and it would just be more efficient to distribute funds um, directly. But at the same time, the tension um, that was coming up in these cases is quite often there, there just wasn't the time or the money to confirm a Chapter 11 plan. Um, a traditional Chapter 11 plan, you've got to file your plan, you've got a minimum of 28 days to your disclosure statement hearing, and usually that ends up being a little bit more like 35 by the time you build in time for objection deadlines and service. Uh, then, you know, you have your disclosure statement approval hearing, and you're looking at, at what's really, um, you know, a minimum of 28, but in reality another 35 to 40 days to get to your confirmation hearing before, um, you know, before you can can start the distribution process, and all the while you're incurring U.S. trustee fees, which have now recently uh, gone up um, under the, the new um, laws, and, and those aren't cheap. You're incurring um, fees for your professionals and just, you know, the everyday burn of, of, of keeping a liquidating debtor alive. Uh, so structured dismissals were presented as this way that, that was sort of cheap and easy and quick. Um, they sometimes, but not always, were utilized as a, me a mechanism to achieve class skipping, um, which is, you know, what was happening in the Jevic uh, structured dismissal. And they also included other bells and whistles that you wouldn't see in a normal Chapter 11 dismissal, such as release and exculpation provisions, uh, a claims um, process and distribution process, carve-outs or gift trusts, conditions on the dismissal, and provisions regarding the enforceability of prior orders um, that would run afoul of the, the standard of returning to the status quo ante um, in a basic dismissal. So I hear two things. I hear that bankruptcy is expensive and that the structured dismissals were almost like a mini plan. Uh, so Monique, could you tell us what, what is it that makes bankruptcy so expensive? Well, the, uh, when I think of all of the, the time and money that I spent on um, becoming a bankruptcy professional, I don't think that it's, it, it's unwarranted um, in terms of the, the costs associated to the practice. But there is this narrative in the industry that bankruptcy is unduly um, expensive. But I would push back on that narrative, and I think it's important for the professionals um, in our industry to take to take um, people to task when they are making this assertion because not only does it do injustice to our practice, but it also affects the, uh, the constituents, the businesses and the consumers that we seek to serve in this industry because outside um, of the bankruptcy processes, there is a lot of leverage and opportunities under the law that are not otherwise available for resolving, um, for, for resolving financial difficulties. So um, in, in in the short, 
in the short answer, I would say that bankruptcy is as expensive as it needs to be to get to a necessary um, resolution. However, the alternative is much more expensive for all parties involved. The 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 debtor that may be saddled with saddled with debt, the creditors that may be unable to otherwise recover on that debt, and then the administrative process that's overburdened when it's not an orderly um, administration uh, uh, of, um, of a debt process. So I, I will push back on the sense and the narrative that bankruptcy um, is, is too expensive. But as it relates to JAVIC, I think that we need to be cognizant of the fact that with respect to structured dismissals, there were very savvy professionals that do what bankruptcy lawyers do all of the time. And what they do is come into a difficult situation and craft a creative solution that gets to a, re a result that is that is acceptable to most parties. Um, and, and bearing equity at the at the forefront. So that's generally the context with within which we see plans and then outside of plans where they are they are not feasible for whatever the for whatever the circumstance would be, you have structures structures created in order to give effect to um, a resolution. And so that's what happens. In in the Jevic case, the issue came up that there's there's this a phrase that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And, <laughs> and, and, and that's kind of what played out in the Jevic case. The whole point um, in, in bankruptcy is to get as many people at the table as possible so that you can have an equitable resolution. And leverages um, are, are tilted and shifted throughout, um, throughout a bankruptcy case in order to get to that point. In Jevic, the, the the truck drivers who in all other circumstances would have been the 100 pound elephant in the room, understanding what the Warren Act is. When I, was, when I clerked uh, for a bankruptcy judge, it was in the early 2000s. That was right after a, a great mass of um, Warren Act litigation. And just to bring it to the forefront to make sure that everyone understands what the Warren Act is, it's another federal statute. So anytime you have any federal law, it could be it, it could be the um, Internal Revenue Code. It could be the uh, it, it could be the t it, it could be j just general um, fraud statute. We we heard on the prior um, panel about the CFPB and in in another federal statute. Anytime there's a juxtaposition of the Bankruptcy Code versus another federal statute, you want to pay particular attention with respect to the Warren Act. The rule is that for general employers, it could be. Um, a small business or it could be a large business. If you have in excess of 50 employees, you have the obligation to warn them if they're going to be fired um, in advance and give them a certain amount of notice. And that law is, as because it's a federal statute, when you're in the bankruptcy context, it's almost sacrosanct. So you're, when you're at the table and you're cutting up the pie or, or distributing the pot, you want to have in the forefront of your mind who you're going to distribute to, and you don't want to run afoul of another Florida statute. In the Jevic case, they ran afoul of that federal statute. I'm, I'm sorry, not Florida, a federal statute. So the federal statute being the Warren Act, the debtor had not warned its employees about them being fired with sufficient notice. And as a result of their failure to warn, these truck drivers had a huge claim that they were that they stood to recover on in the bankruptcy process. But rather than pay out on those claims, the deal was cut that left these truck drivers out. And so we came to a point where you have to deal with the consequences of, uh, of that deal that was struck without the truck drivers at the table. And I think it's important to, to note for those who may have not read uh, Jevic, the reason that they were left out is they brought those Warren Act claims not only against the debtor, but also against their equity holder, Sun Capital, who has a lien on all of the debtor's assets. So the reason that a Chapter 7 conversion wasn't going to produce a result here, and, and I think part of the reason that the lower courts, um, you know, 
approved the structured dismissal and affirmed that decision all the way up through the Third Circuit is that because the, the Warren Act suit was against not only the debtors, but also Sun Capital, and Sun Capital now has a lien on all of the remaining assets, Sun Capital was unwilling to reach a settlement that would provide funds to the Warren claimants so that they could continue to pursue their litigation against Sun Capital. So, and if the case were to have just converted, a Chapter 7 trustee would have been left with litigation that Sun's liens would have, uh, that, you know, could have potentially attached to any remaining assets. And so they wouldn't have had necessarily the pot of funds to go after the, the litigation that they settled with the creditors committee. So, um, so that's why the bankruptcy court and uh, the district court and third circuit looking at this, I think said, okay, you know, the structured dismissal isn't ideal, but it's making the best of a bad situation because if this case converts, it's very possible, um, almost, almost certain that no one gets anything else. And um, just as a quick side note, so the uh, litigation, the Warren Act litigation against Sun Capital was uh, concluded in the recent past, and uh, Sun Capital actually won that litigation, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, okay, so is Jevic a victory for the small guys or the lenders? I think on its face, this Jevic, the Supreme Court decision, was a victory for the small guys, meaning the truck drivers took the matter all the way up to the Supreme Court. They were left out of the deal. The Supreme Court um, declared that that was not um, that that was not proper uh, because it ran afoul of the uh, the statutory priority system um, that the code sets forth, and because they had not been granted consent. And for and they did not give consent for this um, for this treatment um, of their of their claims uh, on, on, under the deal structure, and so it the deal had to be undone essentially. So they won in that sense, but it's a but it's possible to win the battle and then lose the war. And in this case, that is what happened to the truck drivers. Um, not ultimately, because the litigation is still going to play on in their various at, um, avenues that are yet to be determined in the case, but overall, where we find ourselves is on that deal and the funds that were currently available uh, to, to, to uh, to make distributions to any creditors, those are gone because they were, they, they, the asset was controlled by the lien. There was no invalidation of the lien of the secured creditors. So once the deal was taken away and the, and the distribution was, was lost, um, that opportunity um, to access those funds outside of litigating um, was also lost. And the litigation is, is to a point where the recoveries and the cost of pursuing that litigation beyond and on multiple appeals almost makes it impossible. It almost makes it impossible to, re to reach a resolution. The other issue um, that I'm more concerned about is this decision. It creates the possibility um, of increased silos and negotiation in the bankruptcy process. There's a concern that, that, that has, there has always been a concern that negotiations in bankruptcy um, are off time oftentimes um, leave out certain parties and they and there are silos. The issue with Jevic is that it presents the possibility that people may try to reach deals um, even before the leverage um, say for instance that the priority structure would create in the bankruptcy is um, able to be obtained. What that means is that the the secured, the secured creditors may reach a deal with the debtor well before the case is even filed. And so that's before the Warren Act is ever issued, the Warren Act claims are ever at issue. And then those same employees may never get to the point of being able to have bankruptcy-based claims and litigation that they could pursue up. So um, I, I, don't, I, I don't like to 
use really hot button terms, but it could be collusive. I mean, that is the concern a lot of times about the deals that being that are being struck. There is a there is a perception of collusion, and there is now uh, a, a reality that there may be deals that are that have been struck um, in order to specifically ev evade the bankruptcy laws. So do we think that Jevic's going to create more litigation? I would say yes. And I think um, it, even a couple things. I think it will certainly, it's going to cost a lot of money in a lot of ways to try and figure out what does Jevic really mean and what are the downstream effects going to be. Um, I think that, you know, we talked about before, it, it is a very narrow holding, but there are already a lot of instances in courts of how um, it can be ap applied more broadly. Um, you know, it, one of the things that I find so interesting about Chapter 11 practice is that I think there's this constant tension of, you know, we've got our code book, we've got our rules, this is our playbook, and this is our guidebook. But sometimes when we're faced with the practicalities of, you know, we've got this melting iceberg of a company, and if we don't get it into bankruptcy, and if we don't get a sale, and if we don't get it done, you know, all these people are going to lose their jobs, and there's this constant pressure and leverage of just the whole thing's going to implode if we don't make something happen. And I think that's where the rhetoric of, you know, this is the lesser of two evils really comes into play, and I think a lot of times um, wins the day or has a lot of sway. Um, but to me, you know, thinking about the question, is it a victory? I think in some ways it's, I'm like, well, maybe there's an argument. It's not really a victory for anyone because it just inserts a lot of, um, it adds uncertainty into the process. Um, and I think with the question of will it promote litigation, probably yes, because I think you can use it in its narrow holding to, um, stop deals that maybe would have gone through otherwise when you got almost all the parties on board or to the table. Um, and then I think it also is probably going to promote litigation in the, in the sense of, you know, it can be, it could be expanded into um, different arenas. And, you know, Katie had mentioned before, um, you know, other, other aspects of Chapter 11 uh, structured dismissals, like bells and whistles, as we'd call them. And I think there, there are a lot of other code, well, not code-based uh, provisions out there, a lot of other like tool belt, tools that we have in our Chapter 11 tool belt to um, get the deal done and things that have developed over time that are not really rooted in the bankruptcy code itself, but um, like some that come to mind, equitable mootness, third-party releases, even... Um, critical vendor payments that some of these, well, you know, that may be taking a very expansive view of Jevic. I think certainly the door is left open um, for litigants to be able to do that. And one thing I, I think would be interesting is if there ends up being research or statistics about how, how many cases end up citing Jevic, how much money is spent trying to figure out some of these, um, these questions, and I, I wonder in comparison to one of the last um, seminal bankruptcy cases in the Supreme Court, the Stern case, where, where those numbers end up shaking out, because I think that's still, it's, it's been way less of a hot topic recently, but that took a long time to die down. So I wonder, Jevic, um, what other ones may percolate up and how, how, many, how many questions it, it really leaves open. So just a question uh, for you, Alex. It's, do you think that maybe there's a way that this could make bankruptcies cheaper? Because since in Jevic, the, um, one of the main things was end of case distribution. And so this will require everyone to start settling and coming to agreement a lot sooner. And so maybe these cases will, uh, our bankruptcy cases will, chapter 11 bankruptcy cases will run for a shorter period of time. Is there an argument for that? I think that's a good, I think, I think it's a good question. I think that's, you know, I think Jevic is definitely a case like you could very much nerd out on and go down all these different <laughs> rabbit holes. And I think that to me is one of the biggest questions I walk away from Jevic from is, you know, there's, there's mention of, you know, what is more of an interim distribution or agreement versus a final one. And it's like, what, what does that mean? <laughs> and is that more of a just, I know it when I see it, or is it, you know, it, it really is more like at the structured dismissal end of the case. Um, and I think that is, I, I think I'm probably jumping ahead a little bit of our scout, but I think um, 
the Fryer case, which I believe was the first case that really dealt with Jevic um, after it was decided this was a case in the Eastern uh, Bankruptcy Court for the Eastern District of Tennessee. So uh, Fryer was a case where we had a uh, motion to sell and motion to approve a settlement I think it was about eight months into the case, so there had not, there was not really a lot of indicia that this was going to be a successful reorganization. I think, in fact, they had uh, tried bankruptcy unsuccessfully a couple years before, so it, there were certain, in, you know, the red flags were going up of like, this is probably going the way of li liquidation, this is probably going the way of a structured dismissal, something like that. Um, but in uh, the settlement that was at issue uh, was to, sell a piece of property and have the proceeds distributed in a way that would uh, violate um, the uh, priority distribution. So in particular, the IRS was going to get skipped. Um, and several unsecured creditors who were scheduled to receive um, 53 cents on the dollar objected. And there was a lot of court skepticism that really there was anything better that could get done. Um, but ultimately, the court denied the settlement um, in, in a lot of ways was um, looking to, to Jevic and Jevic's teachings to do that and specifically noted, look, this does not look like it's going the way of a plan. It looks like it's going more uh, the way of the liquidation and in particular that this settlement didn't serve a code-related um, objective. And that's another one that I kind of ponder and I'm like, well, what exactly is that going to mean and what are, what are cases going to tell us that that means? One of the other things that I think that even before the Supreme Court's decision in Javik came down um, that was percolating um, in the bankruptcy community is, you know, judges were sometimes approving structured dismissals, but one of the, the judges in Delaware, Judge Carey, would routinely note, um, well, this is a very inelegant way to wrap up your case. And um, there was a lot of discussion among the bar of, what can we do to provide a more elegant solution to get to a Chapter 11 plan um, that might not be as expensive ever, as everyone thinks that it has to be? Um, and in, in Delaware, there's a big push, and, and there's a local rule now um, in our local rules to uh, allow for a combined plan and disclosure statement hearing that would happen a little bit more quickly, where you would get an interim um, get interim preliminary approval of your disclosure statement, um, which in a case that's that's liquidating and it's post-sale, it's very short and sweet. You don't necessarily have a lot of concerns that you're not disclosing enough information because it's, it's just simply not a complicated case. Um, you, set, you set up a solicitation and instead of taking, you know, close to 70 days to get to confirmation, maybe you take closer to 50. Um, and, you know, one of the things that was done in the Radio Shack case is the creditors committee said, you don't need to solicit our unsecured creditors. You have your impaired accepting classes elsewhere. We're kind of getting the waterfall of whatever comes next. Um, so we don't see a reason for, for general unsecured creditors to, to be solicited. And that cut down on the solicitation costs a lot in that case. So um, I think, you know, one of the things that parties can do and should start thinking about doing and have been doing um, recently is, is finding a way to get to a plan that's, that's maybe not as expensive as we all think that a traditional plan process has to be. So that's on the, on the administrative side, things that we can do uh, more efficiently to, to limit costs. But then there are some aspects of JEVIT that challenge um, our, our practitioners in the bankruptcy context on the substantive side. Because with respect to the priority um, skipping, if that's a substantive component of either your plan or your structured um, dismissal order, the issue is going to be whether or not you have consent. That's the only thing that the, um, th that the Supreme Court left us with in terms of direction. So the question is, do you have consent? But what does that mean? That's not a defined term in the code. So now you're thinking consent. Well, what will satisfy consent? Could I give negative notice? Do I have to actually get um, all of these creditors to come in that I plan to skip? Do I have to bring them to the table? And now I've given them a position, a seat at the table in that level, in that amount of leverage, but then what if 
they refuse to give consent and blow up the entire deal and no, and no one wins. And then there's issues about what level of, what satisfies consent. Does it need to be in writing? Does it need to just say, hey, we go along with this deal? Could it be that the unsecured creditors committee could say this is good enough for the unsecured creditors, but a particular member of the committee or a particular unsecured creditors could say that's not enough for me and I individually didn't consent? So we still have these substantive issues that are now created as a result of this case that kind of interferes with the the practitioner's ability to be creative in these difficult scenarios. So, uh, and I'm going to open. So, I'm going to open this question up to the panel, and then I'd also love to hear from any of you if you have experience on this as well. But you know, the question here is: Does Jevic signify a shift into further policing the bankruptcy code and spill over into other Chapter 11 practices? For instance. Have you seen the U.S. trustee taking a more active role in Chapter 11 cases, uh, particularly in settlements <coughs> that bend the rules? I, I think that um, the U.S. trustee's office has definitely, um, when settlements are coming together, taken a very close look at them to make sure that Javik isn't implicated. Um, I know in a recent case we had a settlement in connection with a sale uh, that was supposed to get very neatly buttoned up um, with, a, with a plan support agreement and a plan confirmation, but um, as, as neatly as that's all presented and as, as um, well as that seems to be moving down the track, they're not perfectly tied. It's not as if sale and confirmation will occur exactly together and, you know, parties do have rights to, um, to you know, um, either terminate a PSA for certain things or um, to just decide they're going to breach their obligation. So it's it's never, there's never perfection and you can't guarantee that something's going to happen. So as the creditors committee, we tried to put some language in the sale order that said um, the, the funds that were going to be set aside for distribution to general unsecured creditors. Um, and the plan would pr pay, you know, for um, admin and priority claims in full. But what was going to be set aside for general unsecured creditors could be um, applied um, even if the PSA were terminated. And we got some pushback from the U.S. trustee. We had to sort of um, mold that language a little bit more carefully. And now it sort of says that in the event that something like that happens, the PSA parties will still be bound to support the application of those proceeds rather than um, an order saying that they can just be, um, they can be distributed to those unsecured creditors. So I think we are seeing the U.S. trustee taking a close look at settlements um, and seeing whether Javik's implicated and, and whether it might be, um, you know, making a distribution that, that calls for priority skipping um, that would actually be a final distribution in the case. And outside of settlements, I think that we can we can anticipate seeing courts grappling with this issue as it relates to sales and critical vendor motions. Anywhere there is going to be an interim payment and the payment is going to a party that's not a first tier priority um, uh, priority uh, claimant, then you can expect questions as to whether Jevic is implicated. And you should be prepared, if that is the case, to demonstrate that um, you have one a plan based, uh, uh, a code based um, reason for why you are proposing this course of action, be it a sale or um, a payment to a particular critical ven uh, vendor, and then you need to have um, a explanation of how this process fits into your ultimate um, exit strategy. Just just a quick note on that, thinking back to our discussion about, you know, what makes bankruptcy expensive and why is it so expensive and is it really that expensive? I do think that some of the uncertainties from Javik and if there is really a, a shifting role in the UST taking a more active role and or other parties objecting, I think that not so much even expense, but just the uncertainty of litigation. And sometimes along with that uncertainty comes, it's really hard to predict what the ultimate costs are going to be at the beginning of a case, because especially, you know, when the landscape is shifting in terms of where the case law may be on some of these issues, um, it, it's challenging to predict what the cost may be. And I will say that we've been told with, um, 
in, in our district here that it, it is an absolute priority for the U.S. trustee. Uh, so anytime there is a motion with priority skipping towards the end of the case, the U.S. trustee is absolutely required, you know, from his top boss down to object. That's whether there are other parties objecting or not, the U.S. trustee will be objecting. So that's kind of um, been our experience. Does anyone else have any experience they would like to share with us? You don't have to be shy. <laughs> Please. It, ma it matters. It goes back from, from my perspective. And it's, it's, it's not that I have any, any rationale beyond the fact that the Warren Act is literally sacrosanct. And so it's a federal statute. And if you're going to juxtapose one federal statute against another, then you're going to have to have a very good reason of why you were you, you're you're causing or inter, I guess interjecting the two, and so absent some type of foresight and preparation for, for the Warren Act claims and dealing with them at the table after the fact, their claim is what it is, and it's a Warren Act. So mind you, you, you you're also putting into um, the context the conflict between um, the overall perspective of the bankruptcy code and bankruptcy judges over other Article Three judges and what they can do to claims. Um, and so those are issues that you're, that you're creating in your own case if you go run afoul of the Warren Act. Because a bankruptcy judge, now you're asking a bankruptcy judge to not only um, quiet or quell a right now it's a federal right that you're asking um, the bankruptcy judge to uh, to allow you to extinguish through a bankruptcy process that's not even a bankruptcy plan. It's just something that you wrote outside in the hallway, and now you're asking the bankruptcy judge to say, "Hey, it's okay. The Warren Act thing that Congress passed, ah, no big deal. We can't. We we went outside." in the hallway and struck up something else that we think works better. So that's the issue to me. It comes down to how far you can go in bankruptcy court. And it comes to the whole idea about what people, the perception people have about collusion and deal striking and what goes on in bankruptcy. I, I think, you know, to counter that a little bit, um, one of the real struggles that I think um, that debtors and lenders and creditors committees deal with and what made structures, structured dismissals attractive in some scenarios is the ease with which you can negotiate with certain parties in a case. Um, it is not always easy to negotiate with Warren claimants, um, in part because they're a class, in part because they know that they have this uh, federal right. Um, the other party that it's not easy to negotiate with that often gets pulled in in these situations is the IRS. It is. <laughs> no. <laughs> they're, they're not a party that comes to the negotiating table. Um, and if you do try to, if you do try to engage in those negotiations, they are very slow. It requires a lot of up the chain approvals and down the chain and it takes months and it's just not a, um, it's not something that um, is going to be a quick and efficient out. And so I think that's why um, parties had turned to uh, structured dismissals in part is not because they're necessarily seeking always to exclude a certain class, but because, you know, they look at it and they say, well, there's, there's really no hope of us getting around this. Um, so let's go strike our own deal and see what we can do. And I just thought, just to echo on that, the Friar case that I talked about a little bit before, the parties that the IRS was not a party that objected to it, and that was the party that was being skipped. So it's just, a, it, I think that from a practical perspective, sometimes, like I tend to a lot of times 
like the practical arguments more than the, well, the code says this arguments, and that just may be my personality. But I, I struggle sometimes to say, but we're so close. If we're this close, is there one party that's going to hold us up or that pesky code section that's going to hold it up? Although, you know, I, I know there are a lot of counter arguments to that. But um, <laughs> the, it is, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the other thing I would, um, I guess, pose to the audience is the, the shifting of tides from the past um, Supreme Court to the current Supreme Court, with the current Supreme Court being more textualist and wanting um, to stick so close um, to the text of the code before relief can be granted, and then juxtaposing that against the whole the, the the equity that bankruptcy courts are charged with uh, with pursuing, and the oftentimes the need in order to strike equity is to be creative and efficient and move outside of um, what the code says and rely on the spirit um, of the code in fashioning resolutions. And can you continue to do that in various areas of uh, bankruptcy practice in light of the fact that a lot of the relief that we seek for cause, quote unquote, is not code based? And can you rely on the order that you receive from a bankruptcy judge um, for cause um, not being challenged all the way up to the Supreme Court. Like if, if you just throw 105A in your brief, do you, does that carry, will that carry? Hey, there was a day, there was a day, but that day has long not, gone. Not anymore. Yeah. So are we saying that Jevic no, long, no longer allows for priority skipping? skipping? Um, it, it, the court didn't go that far. You, you can't have structured dismissals. You can't have priority skipping. What you need is consent. Again, we don't know what that consent means and whose consent would be sufficient. Um, the court didn't go um, that far to delineate. So um, I think in the, in the priority skipping context, then you need to try um, to identify um, the the, the parties, the claimants, with um, the most leverage in terms of um, priorities and bring them to the table. It may be um, staggered. It may be, um, it, it may be um, over time, but you have to have at least accounted for them in your presentation before you get in front of the court. Um, because the judges will be reticent to grant that relief um, absent your showing of, of consent. And then secondly, absent your showing of evidence to, evidence to support the plan or the deal that you have struck is code based. It needs to relate back to um, substance that you can find in the code for what you're planning to move forward with. I think the other the other avenue where you know there's still a potential for priority skipping um, this the Supreme Court has a, a whole paragraph where it kind of goes into uh, dicta talking about well interim distributions that serve code related objectives can violate um, the ordinary priority rules as long as they're not attached to a final distribution and they're serving a significant offsetting bankruptcy justification. And, and that paragraph was really going to uh, things like critical vendor payments, certain employee wage payments, and, and things like that that you would kind of see in, in first day orders um, de under the doctrine of necessity. And um, so you, you know, you still have an avenue um, potentially, and, and there can be a lot of litigation that surrounds what is a, a code-related objective or significant offsetting bankruptcy justification, and you know, at what point does an interim distribution um, become a final attached to a final distribution? 
Um, but you can still, you know, there's still potential for um, payments in those settings. And I think one of the things that you might see more and more of, um, and we've certainly seen some of it to date, is uh, debtors and lenders who say, okay, you know, I'm going to take control of this case and I'm going to, I'm coming in, I know I want to buy the company, I'm going to make sure I pay all of the critical trade and then I won't have a committee if I can get that done in the first, you know, 14 or so days of the case. Uh, I won't have a committee and then I can just kind of run um, and we'll see when all of these priority and admin claims actually show up, if they actually show up. Because um, a lot of them, um, a lot of them aren't, you know, not, notwithstanding being served with a sale motion, just aren't responding as quickly in the case. So, um, so there is, um, there's potential for quite a bit of litigation there. I think we're, you know, I think we're seeing the U.S. trustee raising some objections on critical vendor motions and really putting the debtor through their burden to show that those vendors are truly critical and necessary for um, ongoing operations and if they don't get paid, they're really not going to ship going forward. We're not going to ship on the terms that are necessary to keep the debtor afloat. And so that's, I guess that raises um, two interesting questions. And the first is critical vendor. So, so did Jevic change critical vendor? Or, or is, did it make it more stringent, more relaxed? Or is it, you know, just as it was before Jevic was, um, the opinion came down? I mean, I, th I think in my experience, we're, we're still seeing critical vendor motions. We're still seeing a lot of critical vendor payments being approved. Um, it's just a matter of burden of proof. Um, and it's, it's the U.S. trustee telling the debtor, you know, this isn't solved until you put your case on and the judge, um, you know, the judge takes in the evidence. So, um, so they're still out there, but um, I, think that, uh, I think that they're just eyed with a new lens post jevic so what about gift plans? Has Jevic changed those or put, taken those off the table? I'll raise that to any of y'all. Um, <laughs> I don't know that Jevic has taken it off the table. I think that it's really a continuation of the same uh, of the same discussion in terms of what type of presentation um, the, um, the the practitioners will have to make in order to approve such a plan yeah. and I think going back to um, one of the earliest comments on um, the dissent and what was actually the difference between the question on cert and the question that the parties briefed I, that's one in particular that I think could have had a very different answer if we had gone with the original question, which um, just more generally referenced settlement proceeds, whereas what got briefed was um, estate property. Yeah. And, and whether you can still have, um, whether you can still have gifting and, and priority skipping in the context of gifting, I think is still very much an open issue. Um, it's, it's one that's being litigated right now in the Constellation case. Um, and for full disclosure, my firm represents the committee in that case. Um, so we are arguing that. These are my views and not those of my clients. <laughs> um, but in that case, um, the debtors sold their assets to uh, one of the secured lenders, newly formed acquisition vehicles through a credit bid. Um, and in connection with that sale, the committee negotiated for a trust and what would be contributed to that trust from the secured lender was some cash and the chapter five causes of action that the purchaser had purchased um, in, the, in, the, um, in the asset sale. Um, so the, the settlement got structured uh, between when the, I think it was between when the Third Circuit opinion came out, but it might have been a little bit before that. When the settlement got structured. Um, Javik was, um, was still a decision that said, yes, structured dismissals are good, and then um, CERT got granted while this is up. And the, the bankruptcy judge said, you know what, I don't need to decide this until we see what the Supreme Court's going to do. So it oh, literally, <laughs> it literally went on hold. Um, and then was, was argued uh, and briefed before the bankruptcy court after the Javik decision came down. And the issue there is really 
um, whether a case called uh, ICL out of the Third Circuit um, applied and not Jevic. Um, and ICL is a, is a decision out of the Third Circuit where um, the holding was basically that the code's distribution rules don't apply to non-estate property. And ICL, um, it, was a, it was a series of um, healthcare centers. They failed, they ran a sale process, they, they got some offers, none of them were close to clearing the secured debt um, and just really weren't acceptable offers in the view of the debtors. So ultimately it proceeds by a sale by credit bid to the lenders. Uh, the government uh, objected, the US government objected because the sale would have created by its own closing um, a $24 million admin tax claim and there would be no funds left in the estate to pay it. Also in connection with this uh, sale, the creditors committee um, reached a deal with the purchaser whereby those lenders um, who, who were not paying cash, this wasn't like they were taking a cash portion of their bid, they were pay bidding all credit bid and they just took $3.5 million of cash and created a general unsecured creditors trust. Um, the, the bankruptcy court approved that settlement and then the Third Circuit said, you know, when you have secured lenders using their own funds to pay general and secured creditors, we can't say that those are estate monies. Um, they aren't the proceeds of their liens. They um, didn't become part of the estate even as a pass through. They got, they separately went into a separate trust account. They never became part of the uh, estate, were never transferred through debtor accounts. Um, and they said they never, those assets actually never belong to the debtor's estate. Um, so they said priority scheme isn't an issue and the settlement's fine. Um, so the, the question in Constellation is what applies? Does, does JEVIC apply um, and does ICL apply? And, and I guess, you know, factually there's some um, question of whether these causes of action are, our opponents say they were laundered through the, uh, through the sale process. So, um, so that was argued before the district court uh, oral argument was February 11th, so that's under advisement. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see how the district court um, rules on whether you can still have uh, gifting and distribution of, of non-estate assets, if these are non-estate assets, um, outside of the, um, outside of the context of a, um, the code's priority scheme. And so because I want to open this up to any questions y'all may have, I do want to mention that we, we didn't get to everything we wanted to discuss today. So there's still horizontal priority skipping, which was a, there's a case decided on that. And then also what's happening right now in the Jevic bankruptcy case. And so our materials go over both of those issues and other issues. And so I would encourage you to look at those. Um, and then on that, does anyone have any questions? Do they have any thoughts they would like to discuss? We'd love to hear from you. Yes. <laughs> so, so just to be fair, both the, all three courts, bankruptcy, district, and third, were hesitant to approve the structured dismissal settlement. Although I, I think bankruptcy and then district and then third circuit, like, it, it, were it, um, stepped up the ladder, like for um, concern, like concern-wise, the third circuit certainly expressed the most concern out of those three courts. So that's just to be fair, and that I think I cut someone <laughs> off. So I was going to say, I guess to create a narrative, generally because it, because bankruptcy courts are courts of equity, they subscribe to the priority scheme as um, their preference, and so that is what they thought was what should have been done. The issue was the priority scheme is required to be followed in the context of a plan. These guys are not moving forth a plan. So you're comparing the rules of basketball to football. 
and they're saying, hey, well, this is football, and I don't need, I, I can dribble all I want. <laughs> and it's not, and not incur a penalty, even though I'm dribbling the football, which in, other, in another world would cause a penalty. In football, I can do it. And so they did it, and the, the bankruptcy court, hey, thought, I don't like this, but the rule that I would impose or enforce in order to stop you from doing this does not apply. So um, I think in that sense, looking at the way um, bankruptcy um, it, it, it is used to strike equity, they, the, the judge understood on a base level that, hey, they could do it. They were creative. The code allows them and the practice allows them to be creative. That's fine. The district court respected that. This, the third circuit respected that. I think going back to um, the textualism and the, and the process, so the, that was the conflict between the majority at the Supreme Court being textualist and the dissent being focused on the process, meaning you can't change the question at the last inning, and that is what happened at the consent. So, so um, Justice Thomas, our, our circuit justice, thought no, and, and Justice Alito thought no, you can't change the question. We want to stick to and make sure that any the process is correct before we resolve an issue. The majority thought we want to make sure that you are looking at the text and focusing on the text in every resolution that you create in the bankruptcy process. And so that's where we kind of have a disconnect. And I don't know that either is wrong. I tend to lean towards the dissent because it is something similar to every other process that has been um, push through and, uh, and and become a norm in the bankruptcy context, you need more time and it needs to be um, filtered through more circuits, more decisions, more thoughtful practitioners and judges and thought leaders having enough time to chew on this issue and figuring out where to strike the balance between equity and efficiency. So that is why I would, I would agree with the dissent that you should have given it more time for this to play out amongst the courts and let the people that do this every day figure out the best way to, to, to handle it. And I think that can be one of the challenges sometimes when bankruptcy cases go up and I, no means for any disrespect, but I think that you know the folks who deal with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis and are the experts and thought leaders in their field and the judges and practitioners who deal with these issues can understand and just see more easily some of the downstream effects they can have. And even when deciding a very narrow issue, it still may have implications in other arenas. I mean, I think the one critical thing that comes out if you actually read all opinions is um, that tells you where um, where the Supreme Court um, thought you know differently than than the lower courts. Uh, the Supreme Court says, well, they could find someone to pursue a Chapter Seven trustee could find someone to pursue these causes of action on a contingency, um, and the bankruptcy court said. Anyone who is going to do that, you know, without any of their expenses being paid, without money to hire an expert, um, it is, they should really, ha he actually said something along the lines of they should have their head examined. Um, and the quotes are <laughs> materials, it's a good one. Yeah. And so um, I, I think the, the, there was just a disconnect there. Um, I mean, in theory, yes, a Chapter 7 trustee could have gone out and found someone to pursue that on a contingency, but being in a firm that does contingency work on a time, uh, from time to time, we, you know, if you don't have money to pay expenses and you don't have a million dollars for an expert, it's very hard to pursue certain causes of action without, um, on a contingency, so. And I guess that harkens back to the morning program when, we're, when there was a discussion about Midland funding and the resolution um, that the court prescribed of, oh, yeah, you know what? The trustees can, they can, yeah. they can do this investigation. They, they have time. time. They, they have, have anything to do, yeah. you know, but, but the practicalities of it um, make it difficult. The other, um, the other issue that this has created is the, cons it hasn't created it, but it has lent um, 
uh, I guess, lent more credibility to the concept of litigation funding in the bankruptcy context. And having also represented a, a good deal of creditors committees, um, as well as um, trustees and bankruptcy litigation, it is quite expensive. And, that, and, and for the most part, um, my firm does it on, um, on a contingency fee basis. Um, and, um, and, and, and there's risks that are born on either side. The concern I have about introducing litigation funding into this context is for the actual creditors. Because what the same, I, I would tell my trustee client, even though I may have some bias because I'm counsel, and so um, that litigation funding per, um, may cut into um, in, um, my profit margin, um, in, candidly. But also, the issue is whether you're actually um, serving the creditors. Because I, I say the same thing that I say to my startup clients. There are no, there's no free money. So you're getting litigation financing, but the cost of that financing, you, don't, you actually don't know what that's going to be until you receive a recovery. Um, and that's in addition to the cost of the litigation. So meaning, in addition to the cost that you're going to pay for counsel, anywhere between 18, 33%, sometimes 40%, um, percent, then you're going to pay your expenses. Now you're going to pay the interest and the fees on the litigation financing. Then that, and, and that may still be fine with the trustee or the committee, but then what about the individual creditors that are sometimes getting five, 10, and in and, and very extreme circumstances, 70, 80% on the dollar? You're, you add into that, you know, the cost of the litigation financing, is it really worth it at that point? And so I think we had one other question in the far back. I think that I have not seen it, but if I but if I were to see it, and I was representing the committee, um, and the, and wasn't a part of that 363 plan, I have a case right now um, that there's that a 363 sale is being proposed, and I raised the issue um, with the debtors' counsel and um, counsel for the lender because we weren't at the table when this deal was struck, and I raised the Jevic issue, so it's open for challenge even in a 363 context. Um, it's also open, like we said before, in, in a criti critical vendor. So I don't think that a 363 is going to be the answer to JEVIC. That's just another opportunity for a JEVIC challenge. And that was, again, hearkening back to the Friar case, that was an ex it was a 363 mm -hmm. sale um, in that one. A, mu a much smaller uh, Chapter 11 case. Any other questions? Well, thank you again for listening. Thanks. Thank you, ladies. That was so much fun. Yeah, that was fun. That was good. All right. Thanks again to our corporate panel. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we hope you'll join us for lunch. Uh, we have it set up right outside. Uh, please don't forget your bags or parking vouchers. And uh, yeah, let's have some lunch. Thank you. Yeah.